caught up in your presence I just wanna sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never wanna leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me Just want you And I'm sorry When I'm just going through the motions I'm sorry When I just sing another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you, only you. Oh, I'm sorry when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. Yeah. 
guys want to stand, let's get ready for worship.
cry, come. We cry, come. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit.
Time. 
for the Lord God Almighty to raise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh.
be glorified.
Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your manifest presence. Be glorified this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way. We say your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Be pleased, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated or transition however you'd like. How many of you love the presence of the Lord? Thank you, Lord. Look to your neighbor, say you're looking a whole lot like Jesus this morning. A lot more than last week. I'm teasing. Man, thank you, Lord. So I'm um, really excited to be back with you. All everybody have a good week. So so. <laughs> um, man, I, we have some really excited folks around us about fireworks. Man, I was like, I thought they started going off last night already. Was that with the case with any of you? Okay. Yeah, it's been that way. Just give them a holiday to blow something up, you know. Bullseye, you know, we got this English bulldog. He wasn't having it. He's all, rrr, rrr, rrr. Judah's like, Bullseye, shut it down. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but praise the Lord, I was able to get some sleep, and I'm sure it will continue. Come on, Lord. But um, anyway, I'm really excited this morning. I have a word that's really burning within me. I feel like it's now. Um, just now, um, hopefully it'll, it'll land individually and corporately. That's awesome. Just anybody that's awkward, joy will blow up in different places. It's good. It's one of the main fruits of the spirit. Uh, Galatians 5, 22, I think says, uh, just talking about some of the fruits of the spirit is, uh, love. Thank God for love. Joy second in line. Yeah, sometimes it just kind of blows up, you know, it's really good. Kingdom of God's righteousness, peace, and joy. But anyway, I'm going to uh, just jump right in because I, I, I have a little bit of ground to, to gain through the word. It may, it may condense and not be long, but um, in a couple of visuals, if we get there, it could be good. I'll throw up on the LED wall. Just uh, How many of you are visual learners? Uh, I am. I love visual. And uh, we've just been mulling through Second Samuel. How many of you love the Old Testament? Yes, Jesus, come on. How many know this whole book is alive? We need the entire cover to cover. There's people that are kind of negating the old covenant. I don't get it. Jesus said the scriptures speak of me. And um, this whole word speaks towards and to and through the Lord. Um, anyway, Second Samuel, and it's, it's alluded to in Chronicles and whatever, but um, I'm probably going to skip uh, offering it if that's okay. But we have these new fancy boxes on the back walls. On your way out, if you'd like to drop them in there, try and try your shot out. 
your form, uh, tithe and offering, as we so greatly appreciate it, online as well. Um, they could probably put up the thing for online. And uh, I think that's it. We do have an announcement with, um, oh, Jared, oh, I do want to say this real quick. Jared, our drummer, and Tracy, give them a hand. Amazing. Um, it was pretty awesome to raise expectancy, and if any of you need healing, his back was messed up coming on the way to church today. He was driving in pain, and he, I think all you did was get in the chair up here. Yeah, he got up in If anyone wants to take turns going in the drum booth, <laughs> but he was instantly healed. Pain's gone, and uh, isn't that awesome? Um, you all remember from, I think it was last week, yeah, we got the testimony during that prayer for cancer of that lump disappearing in the lady's breast from uh, Jacksonville watching online. So excited about these things. Um, got another testimony, I think from communion this week with the academy students. We took communion together and leaned into it. Hopefully one Sunday morning, I'd love to just teach on, the, on communion. You know, it's one of the just so paramount pillars of Christianity along with water baptism and things like this. And, Communion, man, it's not just some mere symbol, a little wafer and some juice. It's Holy Ghost power. It's a gateway, real time, to encounter the Lord and, and, and align with the new covenant. Um, so much so that you see in Corinthians, I feel authority, man. You start talking about it. <laughs> and, uh, but, but you see in Corinthians, Paul, he literally talks about some, you know, becoming ill, sick, even falling asleep because they took communion and didn't discern the body rightly. Uh, you know, meaning it's, it's a very powerful doorway to become one with the Lord in the new covenant of his broken body and shed blood. But you do that irreverently, it can backfire as well, meaning it's, it's much more than symbolism. Anyway, so we took communion on Wednesdays. We just kind of come in here and go for it with the uh, academy students and and uh, kind of spread all out and get a bunch of Kleenex and just snotting all over the place in the presence. And, and so Zoe was the first hour we took communion and then Judah jumped up second hour. And I think, it, I think when we did communion and went into, Judah was talking about it is finished, it is done. And somebody, we got an email, uh, precious lady, I didn't, I didn't get the approval, so I won't say the name at all, but I think they went and got checked, had a cyst on their ovaries, went and checked and I think the cyst is gone, something like that. I don't know how that, yeah. So, uh, so, so, so good. One quick announcement. Our fall crusade is definitely on a go. This is just for students, sorry. But uh, September, we still have, I think, a good five or so spots open. We'd love to have you if you want to join us. El Salvador, September, going to be buck wild. And uh, that'll be awesome. <laughs> okay, so if you want to turn to Second um, Samuel 6, please. I'm going to read through like nine verses. And to just talk to you from my heart and see where we end up with it. And, um, and we'll see where it goes. I kind of, again, at the end, uh, would love to open up the altars and, and uh, just turn our hearts to him in a fresh way, you know. If you want to go ahead and pick out your spot in your mind. But flood the altars. Just get before the Lord in his presence. Seek him together. I think Zoe's going to come up at the end and take us into his presence as we minister to the Lord. You can pick some aisles or just spread out, come wherever, and uh, let him just flood us with his presence as we, as we yield into him. But watch this. I know, listen, I know, so this is where Uzzah touches the ark and dies, okay? So we, a lot of us know this account. It's going to be good, though. We've got a good <laughs> twist on it. Everybody's like, oh, great. You know, here we go. Uh, but I'm stirred because I can see something in it I've not seen before, and I really feel like it's relevant for this hour, you know? And uh, so, so good from a new covenant lens. But watch, I'm going to read through like verse uh, 9 with you all and just talk to you from my heart. But watch this, verse 1. Um, Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name. I'm in New King James. The Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, and Uzzah in Ohio. Sounds like he's from Ohio. <laughs> the sons of Abinadab drove the new cart. 
And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, and tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. Verse 6, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. And he died there by the ark of God. Verse 8, David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of God come to me? All right, we'll stop there and pick back up in a little bit. Um, so like a, a quick like backdrop on the ark, I think it's just awesome, stirs me. Uh, again, I know like how can a story like this, but hopefully it'll make sense. Um, so the ark of God, you know, it's literally a depiction of Christ in the earth from the old covenant, God with us, Emmanuel. You know, even um, this account, many scholars commentaries they believe psalm 68 david wrote in accordance with this account where it says let the lord arise and his enemies be scattered you all remember that because they were they were taking the ark from bel judah uh, back to the mount zion jerusalem the city of david up onto mount zion so let god arise his enemies be scattered and if you read through psalm 68 it talks about he led captivities captive and it has a little twist on it. Psalm 68 says, and, and people gave gifts to God. But Paul in Ephesians 4 took that psalm and spun it through the new covenant as a depiction of Christ in the ark. The ark in the, it was like the most important relic of God's people in the old covenant. It's like God in the earth. It's crazy. Instructed Moses to, with the blueprint to build this ark so God could dwell amongst man, what he's always desired before sin split things up, you know, to, to walk with Adam in the cool of the day, this intimate one-on-one, -on -one, man, God with people. That's what he's always wanted. And uh, so, so Paul in Ephesians 4, I'll start getting messed up talking about it, but Ephesians 4, he says, we all remember, that uh, if he ascended, talking about the ark ascending to Mount Zion, gave gifts to men. Remember, he twisted it because he goes into the fivefold of apostles, prophets, and how Jesus Christ as the ark ascended and gave gifts to men. Well, Psalm 68, which many believe is in accordance with this right here, says men gave gifts and David them did this the whole way up. But anyway, the ark um, instructed by Moses, we all know, on, on the 40 days of Mount Sinai, got the blueprint, the whole bit, built the ark, was always with God's people all the way through. Uh, often the, Le and the Levites were instructed to carry it, we know. Often three football fields out ahead of God's people. The ark speaks of God near us, intimate union above all things. God amongst man, carrying the glory. And it's, it's paramount that it's always on the forefront. It would be three football fields out from the children of God. I'm going to try and move quick. So you see it with Moses, God's people, Joshua. The ark was always with them up to this point where Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, you all remember them. They still have the, this ark, the same one. This is why David had to go back and retrieve it. This is what I'm building up to. Um, so the ark is with uh, God's people still. Eli, the priest, Hophni and Phinehas, his, his sons were priests just by mere family, you know, getting grandfathered in. But godless men, the Bible literally says Hophni and Phinehas were worthless men for they knew not the Lord. Look, your value in the earth is in direct correlation to how much you know the Lord or not. I don't care how many millions you've got in the bank. Get assessed by heaven. I'm telling you, we're going to be very surprised that day. It says they were worthless men, for they knew not the Lord. Wicked men. So because of this sin in the camp, they go out, run into battle with the Philistines and lose, of course. You can have God with you, but if you're not yielded unto him, you can still lose. And God's favor will lift. So basically, this is when we all remember the Philistines captured the ark of God. It was right in that window when Eli was priest. And I love this too. There's just so much here. But Eli gets rebuked by this prophetic man. He comes up to me and says, Thus said the word of the Lord, you honor your sons more than me. Meaning you don't rebuke them. And he did once. He kind of scolded them, but he didn't correct them to that point. Just want to encourage you guys, like, we got to get back to the word especially in this generation, man, 
don't spare the rod on your children. I'm old school, you know. I really mean it, though. Like, uh, just nowadays, I feel like you can see it with Eli. He was soft on his sons. They let wickedness in, and it, it domino effects, and they lose the presence of God. They lose the ark. They lose manifest God in their midst because of all of this. And uh, it's ironic enough that Samuel, who was raised up under Eli, his sons were off. I just love all this stuff. Flawless prophet. Not one word ever fell to the ground, but I wonder if he didn't take note of what happened with Eli. Anyway, there's a whole thing there. Anyway, Ark gets captured by the Philistines. You think, man, they snatched the Ark, threw it on a cart, handled it all crazy. But when God's people go to touch it the wrong way, they get struck. It's a big difference there too because I don't know if you've ever seen like people in the world, they live frivolous, do all kind of wrong things and never get like punished for it, it feels like. But you sort of slip up and God's on you. It's a beautiful thing because we're in a covenant with him. Big, big difference, you know. It'd be like, you know, Tommy and, and Laura, his amazing wife out there with their new, newborn. You know, if it's some other lady out on the street, Tommy doesn't know. She's running around doing whatever. He's not gonna, He's not going to care. But Laura, now, they're in a covenant. It's a different standard. And so the Bible even talks about how the Father, God disciplines those he loves. So when discipline starts to lift, that's actually a scary thing. You better get nervous. You know, I question salvation when that lifts. So, so you're like, man, Uzzah just trying to balance and pump up the cart of God, but the Philistines just steal it and run off. Nothing happens to them. But, so, but the, it does, but not quite as harsh as Uzzah. So the, they take the ark of God, the presence into their camp. We all know they start getting tumors. Mice are coming in. And uh, they're like, hold on a second. This thing's like a bad luck charm from their secular mindset. Their mediums tell them, I'm just kind of going through the history of it quick. Uh, look, you've got to sow, but they knew the sowing and reaping though. You've got to form these gold mice and tumors, put them in a cart, send the ark back, get it out of here. And so they send, this is where it all goes wrong. It, it gets off. And I pray we as a people individually in our homes and our houses, also corporately would align again in this hour. Um, they send the ark off on a cart. Long story short, they get the ark, God's people, and just put it off in Abinadab's house. This is where we're at now, back up to this point. Who was, the scholars are pretty positive it was a Levite, which always typically needs to be care, in care of the ark. And Abinadab's sons were Uzzah and Ahio. That's why they're driving this cart. So the ark, though, spent 20 years in Abinadab's house just dormant and overlapped into the days of Saul. There's, there's a verse in Chronicles that says in, in Saul's day, they weren't really used to going before the ark much, meaning inquiring of God. So Saul made so many mistakes. David's like David. He basically comes back into full reign here. He's like, we got to get the ark back. We need the manifest presence. We are helpless. He's the central of all things. Or what are we doing? We're wasting our time here. This is what David's doing. But it says in the days of Saul, the ark of God was just kind of, you know, not quite on the forefront of things. So basically, that's where you pick up here in verse 1. It says, again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And it's interesting that when they lost the ark under the time of e Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, in that battle against the Philistines, they lost 30,000 men in that battle. Super ironic, and David takes 30,000 to redeem it. I feel like he was trying to reset things. David arose, went with all the people who were with him from Belgeda to bring up the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who dwell between the cherubim. I want to put it up now, like just the ark. Many of us know, but just for a visual. Um, I think we have one picture. Yeah. So, so watch this. It says basically where God sat. You know, many of us know this, but some may not. But the Bible in... Numbers chapter 7 says that God would literally speak to Moses from between the cherubim. I can't imagine. I sit there, my mind starts going, what was happening then? I feel like a glory cloud starts swirling in between and sparks. I don't know, lightning, maybe nothing. But he literally, God would speak to him from between those wings right there. They called that the mercy seat. In the ark was the, the Ten uh, Commandments, both two tablets. Jar of manna from Moses' day and the rod of Aaron, all of it. This is, this is, and there's so much there. You could spend like probably a year on just a series on the ark and all the symbolisms, this, that, and the other. But you see the gold poles because a Levite, which all of us, you know, by the covenant of the Lord um, should be, be uh, grafted into that. But you can see these poles are where the Levites would carry God's ark on their shoulders. 
they think probably four. And they would have six mentioned, but then they'd rotate out. So God would speak. This is like the most important symbol of, of their day. And watch this. This is where they messed up, though. So David gets 30,000 people. The ark's not been on the forefront for quite some time. But he, a light bulb goes off. He's like, guys, I'm in full reign now. We need God's presence. And I pray practically new covenant now time. We look at that and go, look, we are useless without the ark of God. It's the symbolism of Christ. He's got to be the central point of everything we do. Everything. If he's, a, he's a barely off on the side, things are going to get off quick. And David knew this. So he's like, we've got to. So he makes a big, big deal. 30,000 people, all like the elites. They all go to Bel Judah, which is Abinadab's house, to go get the ark. But watch the biggest mistake they make right here. Verse 3. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. God is never going to be set on a cart. Remember, the only time God was ever set on a cart was by the Philistines to put him back because they didn't want to touch it anymore. So to David's defense, he's not been on the forefront even with the ark for quite some time, but they probably got to Abinadab's or thinking, oh, yeah, we know the story. It got here on an ark. Let's build a new one, though, a nice fancy one. Let's put together some of our new strategies of the day. And pull God on. Everybody thinks the big mistake was who's touching it. That wasn't it. This is the biggest. It goes out of its way in one verse to mention this new cart twice. And I feel like we're doing that in this hour unknowingly. Churches, our strategies, our, our man, I could go on and on. Um, and at the end, I'm going to read a lot. of just was blowing through notes in the secret place on this. And I pray the Lord to reset us, you know. I feel like far too often we're trying to go to the new thing. And look, it's all here. We've got go we to go backwards to the book and do this well. Go back to living pure, wholehearted devotion to the Lord and his word. Fasting, prayer. Who cares if it's not relevant, doesn't fit in. I'm not trying to have some new cart. I'm trying to go back to the original blueprint. And you do that well, I'm telling you, heaven will come. And uh, so, so it says, so they set the ark of God on a new cart, brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill at Uz in Ohio. The sons of Abinadab drove the new cart. They're probably thinking, look at us. And they, they say, scholar says, about a 10-mile journey from Abinadab's house on a hill so that they come down and go back up to Mount Zion, Jerusalem, city of David. Think about a 10-mile journey. A cart's a lot easier. Oxen are pulling it. You can just dance and play your music. And they still had the worship and everything. They even had Levites pulling, driving the cart. They thought they had everything going just right. But you'll notice what I want to focus on is Nacon's threshing floor. Nacon, Nacon, it's got different pronunciations. But, but I feel like this threshing floor is what the Lord's figuratively bringing the church through right now. And it represents a res restoration of first love and the fear of God. These two ingredients are an absolute must into the recipe of the ark returning. First love, I'm telling you, and we're watching it like on paramount levels. I was just talking to a dear friend the other day. Uh, you should see the things we see in emails close up front and far off. The Lord's bringing individuals and corporate houses through this threshing floor, and I'm telling you, you will not make it through if first love and the fear of God is not restored. And I'll explain further. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's just it's burning, and I pray the Lord would just brand us again, reset us, recalibrate us in a beautiful way. So we can have the ark back, him at the center of all things. So it says they uh, put him on this new cart, drove the new cart. Everybody thinks we're happy. Everything's going good with our smart new idea. Newsflash, Moses' blueprint was, was Levites carry him. Man always carries the presence. You don't ever throw God on an ark. I mean on a cart, the ark on a cart. It's be oh, yeah, this is my next image. Uh, I, sorry, these are so old and ghetto. This is all I could find. <laughs> See, that's so bad. We need like some new Holy Ghost filled artist. Like, <clears throat> anyway. So look, you've got the wheels, you know, created by man. So smart, so smooth. And the carts can pull it. Less effort, ease. It's the new thing everybody's doing. It's the new influence. And we can network with you and do this and do it. No, nah, man, give me the old way. I'm telling you, give me glory. Give me five people with raw glory. We'll flip a nation. But everybody's in, in this out, it looks good on the outside until you hit Nacon's threshing floor and you will be sifted. I'm telling you, may it not be said of us. So look, David's dancing. We're all good, but uh, the threshing floor is where you get exposed. So, and it's funny, Uzzah, he lives on a hill. I would have thought, man, things would have flipped trying to come down, a cart downhill. There's no brakes. 
you know, something would have went wrong there, but it just so happens to tip and get exposed at a threshing floor. Threshing floors speak of sifting. That's what they do, that you throw up wheat back in the old day. And, you know, it even says that Jesus has a winnowing fan in his hand in the Gospels because you throw up wheat and chaff together and the wind blows through on these threshing floors. Sometimes you beat it out, but there's different ways to separate the chaff from the wheat to get out that which God's really looking for. So that's what threshing floors do. And I believe right here, Nacon's threshing floor is the threshing floor of restoration for first love and reverential awe. Reverential awe, not so popular. I know I've been teaching on that some, but I see it everywhere now. It's like it's coming on the forefront again. And so um, I have here, I believe the church is being brought through Nacon's threshing floor, figuratively speaking, as God is restoring first love and the reverential awe of God back into the church. And if individuals along with corporate houses are not willing to make intimately knowing and loving him of utmost priority while living lives that are completely given over to the fear and reverential awe of God again, they will be removed at this checkpoint called Nacon's threshing floor. He's not playing games anymore. You can feel it. It's almost like when things amp up in the book of Acts and Ananias and Sapphira merely lie about already giving a ton of money. I'm thinking, man, that was amazing of them. But Peter's like, it's this checkpoint. I can feel the Lord's bringing everybody through because we're nearing a wedding now. Things matter really now. Whereas we may have gotten through in other seasons. And so um, it says, and they brought it out of the house of Benadab, which is on the hill, accompanying da 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 da, da verse 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzu put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for uh, the oxen stumbled. And oxen, you could go on here forever, but they speak of, the works of man's servanthood, very good. It's one of the faces on the four living creatures, an ox. They pull, they get things done. But sometimes we get so top heavy in what we're doing for God in our work and service, and we lose that personal touch of us carrying him. Yes. And when that happens, you're guaranteed to get sifted at this threshing floor. And far too often, I feel like a lot of us are, look, I'll be honest with you, I feel like, I, and I, I, trust me, I know the, uh, we, I travel a bunch, we hear all the stories from 2020, when things, you know, hit the, hit the earth. And I, I get it. My, my heart sympathizes for both sides. I get it. But I can tell you, I feel like one good thing, the Lord, he'll, how many of you know he'll use all things for, together for the good of what he's doing? I feel like it, in a good way, it really exposed a lot of things. And, and a lot of that's continuing to happen by this threshing floor. And I can assure you, first love, for, sorry, I forget about the balcony, folks. You all are beautiful. First love and again, the reverential awe, if those are missing now in this current day and age, you will get exposed quickly. It doesn't matter how big your work is, how fancy and whatever wheels you got on your cart, this new and latest and greatest thing, it will um, get exposed. And so um, just want to read to you a little bit and then pick back up. Um, yeah, I touched on this earlier, but, but I'll let you know from the notes. Uh, Threshing floor, sift and remove that which is not from God or pleasing unto him. And Uzzah represented both the loss of first love and contempt in regard to the things of God. Absolutely no fear of God. He lost the honor, the esteem, the value and reverence of God Almighty amongst mankind. Look, may we never come off of the severity of God while we simultaneously preach of his unmatchable kindness. We need both, but you get too top-heavy into the goodness, grace, and lovey-dovey and, and kindness alone. It gets in balance. The severity is in there just the same. Very, very healthy. Uh, may we never come off of verses such as Hebrews 10.31 that clearly proclaim it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You see what I'm saying? That the ark had been kind of dormant for 20 years. They figure, oh, he was on an ark last time. Just throw him on an ark. This will be awesome. This will be perfect. Ooze is hanging out for just anything in case anything tips. And I guarantee you, right when they put God on an ark, he's going, uh-uh. The whole way, I promise you. They thought it just happened at the threshing floor, but the whole way God's going, no, no. I don't, you don't understand. I don't get carried by the things made by man. I get carried by man intimately. I don't do, I don't do the, thing, the way you think things. I don't care how flashy you think your new card is, and it's a better way. I set this whole thing up to intimately be, be carried on the shoulders of men because I want to be near you. I don't get pulled behind on trailers. And so first love, that intimate touch, when it starts missing, reverence all goes out the window as well, and both of them will get checked quickly. So um, I have here, uh, new carts speak of systems made by man 
versus the very ark of God being carried by man himself. This is when God is riding on four wheels made by man versus being intimately carried upon the shoulders of four men themselves. God will not be carried along upon your man-made systems, programs, and ideologies of no first love. I mean, look, I was talking to a dear pastor friend recently when, when the 2020 thing hit. He's been in the game for a minute. So I've been traveling for about a decade, right? But the pastoral side, it's a whole nother deal, and it's awesome. It's just amazing. Seasons God takes you through, whatever. But meaning he's seen a lot come and go, fads and movements and this, that, and the other. And he says, man, I'm telling you right now, the things that have worked, the strategies, there's a lot out there. He said, they're not working anymore. It's like the, the Lord's pulling the rug out from under. Everything's changing. And if we don't come back to this book, look, just drop the whole popularity thing. Nobody cares in heaven. I'm talking about where it matters. Drop the whole trying to be relevant. And if we just lock up in first love in him, carry his glory. Of course, the practicals take care of what you got to do. But get back to just obeying the word really, really well. All of a sudden, the ark comes back in. Things align. Persecution, oh, yeah, it'll come. Religious will hate you. That's fine. But he's there. He's there and pleased. And um, it is so, so beautiful. But I have here the original way of carrying the ark. Oh, yeah, let's go to that image. That's my last one. I'll stop boring you with the horrible. Uh, yeah. So, see, this one's that even. No, it's about the same age. Probably the 1400s or something. So, but so see here is after where David, he's like, at first he's, he's angry. He's like, oh my gosh, you know, Perez Uzzah, he names a place which means outburst against Uzzah. God's angry. What in the world? I can't, you know, I can't even take him to my city. So we all know if you read further, David just tucks the ark away at a nearby house, Obed Edom's house. There's a whole nother thing. They're so powerful. Obed Edom's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Yes, Lord. I guarantee you, the ark was the central point of everything he did. He'd like make his sandwiches around the ark, like <laughs> sweep around the presents. It's everything. He'd go to bed at night, dust it off, and go and just watch, and had little security cameras on all corners. And, and sure enough, it says, um, God blessed everything Obed-Edom ever thought about doing or touching. And all he did was just have him there. He's just got to be there. But we can't get them there on our new cart systems. They're just, we got to go back to the basics of, Lord, help me just love you really, really well. Simple. Just simplify. Help me detach from the cares of this world. I don't want to care. What's on your heart? What are you doing? I want to be captivated by your eyes again. I want to be, be caught up in your voice, your manifest presence. You're everything. You're everything. And I'm telling you, too, if we're not careful, there's a, there's a cliche pop. People are learning the talk of intimacy, but it's not there. You can feel it. You get around and be like, hold on, man. They don't drip with oil. When you talk about the Lord, they don't, you know, you can tell. I'm not trying to judge ever. And we've all been there, had better months, and that's okay. But where I'm getting as even this intimate lingo and, and people are knowing the, the catchy phrases on it. I'm talking about for real, though, when nobody's watching. And, uh, and so, um, but you can see. So David, you even read in Chronicles, he, he says, look, boys, man, I went, did some homework. He caught wind that Obed-Edom's house is blowing up with, like, blessings. His corn on the cobs are getting, like, this big. You know, everything's going crazy with Obed-Edom. So he's like, we've got to get the ark back to the original plan, you know, back to the house. And, and later you see Obed-Edom was a doorkeeper. He's like, no, no, I got Just keep me anywhere. I'll be a janitor near the ark. Keep me near the presence. And I said, we just get back there. Look, if it looks amazing and, and it's important to man or you have some, you know, status of notoriety, God puts you there, awesome. Nobody knows who you are, awesome. Just be near the ark. If it's with a broom or on a platform, it doesn't matter. It's just him. So, um, so David catches wind of it. He's like, look, boys, I went back to the drawing board. We did it all wrong. God told Moses specifically, that's what the poles are there for. We didn't know that. Like the golden poles and the four rings, like the, we threw it on an ark. You can imagine those poles are just sitting there dangling on nobody. And he's just pulling God behind on a cart. And so, look, if you read, it says, uh, David was afraid of the Lord that day. The fear of the Lord came back. Massive, massive that the fear, the reverential awe. In the new covenant, when love is upright, it's not a scary thing. It's, it's healthy. The fear of the Lord turns a man away from evil. And the blessing of God just tracks down on those that fear him. It checks you at a different level. You go to write things to people, you're like, hold on. I know I'm saying it this way, but that's not actually 
I'm bearing false witness right now. Their thing, when I say it like this, it, th that's what the fear of the Lord does. It checks you like, hold on, Lord, forgive me. Help me. Even if this makes me not look so hot, I got I to gotta say it this way. Because I care about your ark being near. I care, about, I care about you being in the center of everything I do. It's really precious and beautiful. It's not walking on eggshells. It's just like it's walking in perfect love. Like an, uh, an amazing spouse would do. No guile. Pure. It, keep, it keeps things upright, you know. So, um, but it says, uh, David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark come, uh, come to my house? Come over by us. Let's go to uh, bring him to Obed Edom. But verse 12 says, now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Look, some of us, and that's why I hope it will apply personally too and corporately, how, wherever it would land with each and every one. But some of us, and look, we, you know, do, just in ministry, you, you deal with a lot in counseling, whatever. And I'm always like, man, you need him. Here's some practicals, here's some verses, but I'm telling you, amp up him, pursue him. You need his glory in the house. He fixes everything. If you get the ark in the house, everything starts getting blessed. You get, it's a vacuum of glory. Everybody gets sucked in. The way we're children, they, whatever it is, the, the division, the unity, when the glory is the center peace, it, it blesses everything. We need more of him in our homes. Amp up the secret place, cut out the other things and amp up him. Get his glory there, worship him. So um, this is what's going on with obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went up, brought the ark of God from the house of obed Edom to the city of David with gladness. Watch this, verse 13. If we can put that other image up, the one from the... 40s. Um, watch this. Verse 13. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord. See, before it was an ark, uh, a cart, sorry. But then now, those that are bearing, because David reset, he said, okay, yeah, we can't do carts. What were we thinking? The other beautiful thing is, too, practically, if all four are walking together and you hit a threshing floor, you won't get exposed. One may fall, but the other three are supporting. You're going to walk right through it and be fine. But we've, we've got anything of man in this hour. It's, I'm telling you, it's gone. I'm seeing it happen at a pace I've never seen before. I'm telling you, we see it by the week. Again, up close and afar. It's just the Lord's like, nope, nope, I love you. Super gracious, slow to anger, full of kindness and mercy. But nope, not in this hour. My son's bride is near. The wedding's near. This is, no, nah, not in this day. And it's this naked threshing floor that, that he's forcing. If you want the ark of God to fully come back, you've got to go through this threshing floor. But the problem is you can't get through that threshing floor without first love set back in place in the reverential awe of God. And I pray you just do it again in us, you know, in our homes, in our personal car, on the way to work, just us and him corporately. And so you can see, though, how much more intimate it is now. There's touching manifest but still the reverential all not touching the ark just the poles and and having things align and um but i have here the original way of carrying the ark speaks of god's presence and voice at the center four priests on all four corners just like the four living creatures in heaven that surround the throne it's a blueprint of what's already there speaks of unity the when, when he center everything unifies the direction one goes in, they all go in with God himself at the center, power source of it all. You know, like maybe William Tommy Chris will show me. You want to come up here real quick? This would be fun. Visual. These handsome glory carriers. <laughs> but like maybe we'll, we'll, maybe we'll go that way. You, you Levites will be on the front office that way. So like look, if let's maybe right first foot, right foot first, boom, left. See, and if I stop and look, hey, you know, you, it's, it forces unity. You can't just pull and go off and then say, you got like gold on your back or something. And so anyway, uh, say Tommy trips on Nakin's threshing floor. Boom, we got him. You know, it, you're going to make it through with, with first love and the reverential all, whereas cartwheels and oxen, they, they don't know. They're just pulling and driving them. You guys did amazing. Go give them a hand. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the glory at the center, too, speaks of unity. You, you can see it. The way God set it up, so beautiful. God's in the center, elevated, too. I love that he put that really um, the, the ark 
you know, you can see how it elevates above. He could have put the rings at the top by the lid and the, and the ark dwell low, kind of like it did on the cart, but it elevates God to where he needs to be. He's in the center of all, keeps him uh, preeminent over all things. And so watch this. Also, uh, just some notes I'm going to read to you and we'll um, just seek the Lord together. I pray just come on us corporately. And some of you may need to uh, go, feel free to be dismissed, but watch this. Uh, you start pulling God behind you as if to just throw him on a trailer with some brake lights and blinkers. This is the day you can guarantee first love and the fear of the Lord have left your midst. And guess what? You will not make it through the checkpoint called Nacon's threshing floor. Nacon's uh, threshing floor is exposing so many in this hour because they have left the original way. Don't ever think you've got some better new way and new cart system and please hear me. I get revelation and strategies that heaven gives. Please, you know, go for that. I hope you hear me. But I'm just, my point is we're getting off of the word and just going off. The, and we don't know it. I think our intentions are well, but intentions don't bring the glory. Good intentions. Peter had great intention of protecting the Lord and cut somebody's ear off. He had great intentions, Peter did, about, no, nobody's going to kill you, Lord. And Jesus rebuked him as Satan himself. So good intentions don't really carry weight on the eternal side. It's, it's him. We want him. Just want him. And, uh, and so anyway, um, don't ever think you've got some better new way, a new cart system that you can just throw God on and go about your business, pulling God behind you as if he's a boat on a boat trailer. There's no better way than the original way that God set things up from the beginning in the inherent word of God. There's a reason this thing called the word of God is closed shut as far as inerrancy without error or exemption from error. It is finished. It is done. We must get back to the word of God, the original blueprint, and yield our lives wholly unto it, wholly unto him, wholly unto his way and his voice. Pulling God on a cart also speaks to those that would want to just bring God along the way to merely be involved in what they're doing in life. That's what it speaks of. Let's just make sure God's into what we're doing. And I want God involved so that he might bless what I'm doing and who I'm becoming and what I'm inspiring to be. This is so prevalent, I'm telling you. When all along God isn't trying to bless what you're doing and come alongside your plan and agenda, his plan is for you to die that he might be your plan. I'm telling you, this is just the gospel, man. Jesus is like, oh, you want to be disciples, is that right? Okay, you got a notebook? Take down step one, die. You ready for step two? Yeah. Die. Oh, three, you ask. Die. Yes. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. It's beautiful. There's life there. You want to gain your life, you'll lose it for his sake. But you lose it, you'll gain it. It's what he's looking for in this hour. Dead folks. Yeah. I don't care if it's a long. David was like, oh, wow, we missed the plan. Okay. Levites, not only that, if you read further, he says every six steps, 10-mile journey. Probably they cut out a few miles because they got to Obed-Edom's house. But let's call it seven. Every six steps, he stopped, and they made sacrifices. It's way longer and harder sometimes God's way, but yet it's so full of glory, it's actually the easier way. Amen. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. It's easy and light, but also the narrow path can be hard sometimes compared to just flesh alone, but it's really glory there. It's really easy. And so every six steps, which I believe speaks of the end, the end of man and the beginning of God, they, they you know sacrificed and kept going. But... um. I have his plan is for you to die that he might be your plan and he be at the center of all of who you are. And then from that place, just as we saw in the following verses with Obed-Edom, one of God's greatest desires is to bless everything within your entire world. But we have it all backwards. We want our new cart, our new strategies, our own methods and plans rooted in our agenda and then we just want to make sure and keep God attached to what we are doing, similar to a lucky rabbit's foot in hopes that all will go well. I have here a newsflash. God's not going to be anybody's lucky rabbit foot. He's going to be at the center, stabilized by first love and mobilized by the reverential awe of God. If not, Nacon's threshing floor will sift you and make sure you are removed. Sorry, I was a little heavy, <laughs> but we're going back into the, the presence all, but it, I feel like it's heavy for good, though, you know, uh, in a good way that he's trying to draw us back into the main thing of, of him, you know. And I think we, again, our intentions are well. We don't uh, mean anything by it. But if we're not careful, 
we find through time, we look back and go, oh my gosh, yeah, I have put you on my new cart. And I'm just pulling you along and hoping you'll just be attached to what I'm doing. And, and I call it you because it's things for you. Kind of like the Matthew 7 preachers that, Lord, see all these things I did for you? He's like, I don't even know you. But I prophesied. I cast out devils. I did many mighty exploits in your name. He's like, workers of iniquity, depart from me. You know, and what he's looking for in this hour is a bride that's like, man, you are the center of it. I don't care what it looks like. Obed Edom, I'll, I'll sweep the door. I'll keep the door for the ark. And uh, I pray He'd take us back there in this hour, you know, again, individually at home in our, our uh, families, marriages, with our children and all, and, uh, and in corporately, of course, as well. And I think he's doing it. It's really exciting. It's, it's starting to expose and sift the men from the boys, so to speak, but I pray we would yield again. And what it's going to look like is first love returning, that intimate touch again, that nearness that he always intended with the reverential awe. Uh, so you guys want to stand, and Zoe, you mind helping me? Yeah, I'll pray. Lord, thank you so much for your, your word. In your presence, God, I pray that you would um, take us back to the beginning. You know, I'm reminded in Ephesians 2, where uh, Jesus is talking to the church of Ephesus. He's affirming them, correcting some things. And, and he says, this one thing I have against you, though, you, you left your first love. And he tells them how to get back there. He says, just do what you did at first. Let's go back to the Levites carrying the ark, not the new thing. The new thing is what got you off in the first place, the new cart. We, we don't need a new cart. Just go back to what you did at first. Remember those days you spent hours and you were just highlighting the Bible, even verses you had no clue what they meant, just, just so stoked about the word and wearing it out with the highlighter. And so caught up in him, the slightest things that God was speaking, his manifest with that first love and passion that it would be, be dominant again in our world. And, uh, and with it inherently comes the reverential awe, which is, which is natural. Nothing we need to work up, just being in him. So you can play as you feel led, babe. So yeah, Jesus, take us there again, I pray. Be glorified. Be at the center of all we do in our homes, in our relationships, in our churches, in our houses, corporately across the world. I pray that you would have your way. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. Loving kindness, slow to anger, abounding in mercy and love. But I pray to you would help us uh, get through Nacon's threshing floor in this hour. Sift us, I pray. What good are we without the ark anyway? We're helpless without you. So reset us, I pray, this morning. Re recalibrate our world. Set us back on track to just blow right through Nacon Nacon's uh, threshing floor of first love and reverential awe. Be glorified and pleased, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name. Yeah, I wanna invite you, as I mentioned earlier, you can come around the front, and kneel before the Lord and fill the altars, the aisles, always gonna worship. I'm gonna keep praying probably, but you can come now and just pray a wave of his presence consumes us. And if some of you need to go, that's totally fine as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray you recalibrate our hearts, Lord, touch us. I pray for tangible, manifest presence again to sweep through our homes, captivate our children's hearts. Let your word be above all to us. Let your word come alive again. Be the excitement of the day to know you and love you. Be one with you. Tenderize our hearts again to love and know you. Remove all of the side agendas, our new strategies and carts. We want to carry you intimately like you always attended it to be. I pray even those watching at home, the presence of the Lord, sweep into your home even now intimacy come again 
first love. And we return back to the main thing of loving and knowing you. Come, Lord Jesus. Shambamba, stay, stay, stay. Shambam, robos, today.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, have your way in our lives and in our homes, in the workplace, corporately. Be pleased, be glorified. We love you. 